You know, I grew up an athlete. Uh, basketball was my sport. I, I know it's probably not hard to believe as big of a man as I am. Um, I was not really great at basketball. I was pretty good until uh, the other boys went through puberty and grew a foot, and I never grew. Um, but at 5'5", 130 pounds when I graduated from high school, you can imagine I was quite a force on the basketball court. But one of the things that I remember about uh, being on the basketball court was a coach saying to me, and I would later hear other coaches say this to their athletes, no matter what the sport, maybe you've heard this if you were an athlete, leave it all on the court. And if when the game's over, you still got energy, you didn't give it all. And I, I was thinking about that this morning um, because quite honestly, there are some Sunday mornings when both services are over even if there's a meeting afterwards where the morning ends and I've still got a lot of energy in me. And I wonder, have I given it all on a Sunday morning? And uh, this morning, I'm already feeling a little bit weary. Um, part of it was probably staying up too late to watch my favorite team play football and having a lot of energy ex expended uh, as I watched that. My son reminds me, Dad, you're getting a little excited. <laughs> it's fun to cheer for your college football team. Uh, some of us in the room are having a hard time cheering for theirs this year, but <laughs> I kind of expected some because that's what you guys do. Love the Aggies, I just, I, and I really do have compassion for all of you this year. Um, <laughs> don't worry, next year is our year. That's the common anthem, next year. But I'm a bit weary and out of breath this morning because the songs we've been singing this morning I just couldn't help but sing them with all my heart and with all my breath. And part of it was our team. I could just see in Mandy's eyes this encounter she was having with the Lord, and I just wanted to encourage her on and spur her on and, and celebrate the moment she was having with the Lord right here. I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but uh, I find that when tears start to show, um, the Lord is meeting. The Lord's meeting with someone in that moment, and I want to hold it as a holy space. And it was happening. Right here. Today we are in John 9. Uh, some of you have been running through this book with us, the Gospel of John. Uh, some of you are late to the game maybe and don't have one of these books, and I'm really sorry, but all 700 are gone. And, but there is a PDF of this book on our website, and you can go catch up. It'll take you about an hour and a half um, max to read the first nine chapters, and that's if you read it slowly and intently. And you'll catch up with us. We'll do John 10 next week. But as we go through this, this gospel, the reason that we changed our, our direction a little bit and moved away from series preaching uh, was because I, I was starting to feel this thing in me that series preaching was as holy as I wanted to try to make it, it was just an attempt to be entertaining. It was an attempt to find something that might grab your attention, put some visuals up here, uh, and then I'd go running for scriptures that I could use to prove the point of the, the series, but nonetheless, the series was the thing. And uh, I grew weary of that and began to feel unfaithful in that. And I've been asking myself um, a question that I wanna ask you. Why did I come today? Like, why am I here? Of all the places I could be right now, on a Sunday morning at, 9.45 or whatever time it is now. Why am I here? Why did I choose this place? I mean, I know that right now in this 9.30 service, there's a, a couple, a family, who's never been in this space. They've only watched online. And I know they're here, and I'm really grateful that they're here. There's another family I bumped into, and I almost lost it because I had not seen them in so long. I've missed them so bad. They're here. Another family who has shown up in pieces and parts are here today together. Why? Why'd you come? I mean, some of the things that I can tell you are gonna happen on a Sunday morning that I've come to trust here is that you're gonna have a really talented worship team sing some really beautiful songs, and they're gonna do it with wonderful tone in their voice and excellence on their instrument. Some of you came for that because you just really love good music, really love to... Hear Doc sing last week and you wondered if he might do it again today. 
Some of you came today because you've heard that our children's ministry, this children's church time, is one of the best places for a kid to be during the week. And you wanted to come because you wanted them to have the chance to go in there and, and have a good time and learn some stuff along the way. Others of you came uh, because maybe you've been watching online or maybe you've been here with us for a while and you have found that whoever is sitting on this stool and teaching from the word of God, that it'll be something that'll be meaningful, um, in many cases valuable, maybe even inspiring. And it'll help you get through the rest of this day or maybe it'll help you get through the rest of this week or maybe it'll help you get through the thing that's been weighing you down. Um, but I've been finding myself asking the question, did anybody come for Jesus? Did anybody come to see him, to meet with him, to encounter him, to, to go away and be able to tell somebody, I was with Jesus this morning. I was at church. I was with Jesus this morning. The topic of John 9 that we'll get into here in a moment is a blind man being able to see. Now, I don't know if there's anybody currently in our room. I suspect there's no one at home watching online who's literally blind. Maybe they're listening. Most of us would say we're not blind. We see just fine. But we're gonna talk about blind men. There's two types of encounters that we find in the Gospels with Jesus and a blind man or blind men. There's the one in Mark chapter 10 that I wanna start with where you remember the guy named Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus heard, because people who can't see, they listen better. He heard that Jesus was coming to town, that Jesus has, has been coming near, and he realizes from what he's heard that Jesus could do something for him, that, that the blindness he has, maybe Jesus could do something about it. And so the, the gospel of Mark tells us that Bartimaeus began to shout, Jesus! Over here! Begging for the attention of Jesus. And the people around Jesus said, hey, tell that guy to shut up. We're trying to go somewhere. Jesus is easily distracted. He's got some ADD issues. He's always stopping to help people. We're on our way somewhere. He said lunch was soon. Tell that guy to keep it down. But Jesus loved distractions because it meant opportunities to reveal his power and compassion and grace and mercy and healing in the lives of another. In this particular gospel, in, in 10, chapter 10, verse 51, Jesus asked Bartimaeus when he drew near, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, I want to see. I think maybe the, the, the gospel writer quit writing because I'm wondering if maybe he said, I want to see you. But when you haven't seen for most of your life, you just want to see anything. But in Bartimaeus' situation, once he sees Jesus, cast his eyes upon him, connects what he's heard of him, heard from him, and now his eyes lock with Jesus as he's, there's nobody else I want to spend my time with. And the Bible says in Mark 10, that Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you. But immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. You've been healed, you got what you came for and I go and live your life. Go and do the things that you do after your Sunday meeting with me. Look, I met your need, I checked your box, I did what you wanted, so go and do what you do. <laughs> but when you've seen Jesus, There's no place you'd rather be. So why'd you come? Did you come to see him? I wanna see. And the only reason I'm coming here on Sunday mornings is I wanna see Jesus myself and I want you to see Jesus too. This is why I come. I could do something else. I'd probably be really good at other things. I know I could make a lot more money doing other things. And I wouldn't have to take my job home with me every night. I could do other things. I can't do anything because I've seen him. And I've seen what happens when you see him. I watch lives get changed when people see him. And so for those in the room who, 
who keeps showing up to see a band and to see a preacher and to see a children's space, and you, you've not come looking for Jesus. He's, he's come looking for you. What I found is that life can get pretty dark sometimes. Life can get pretty difficult sometimes. Life can get pretty lonely sometimes. And what I find is that when you're blind, those things just cling to you. But when you have eyes to see and when you have seen Jesus, these things start to fade. Darkness becomes light. Difficulty becomes easier. You got somebody walking this thing with you and lonely, thing of the past, you've got a companion that'll never leave you. Stuck to you like gum to the bottom of a shoe. This is the way Jesus wants to be with us. And for those of you who may have come into this place and life is not light and life is dark, uh, next Sunday, this is sort of a, I wanna make sure that you're all aware of this. If you don't read my newsletters, this is my time to let you know that for weeks now, I've been looking ahead to John 10, next week, chapter 10, because I'm becoming more and more aware that there are folks in this room and many more who will never walk into this room whose lives are dark and desperate and lonely. And suicide is a topic that has crossed your mind or the mind of someone you love. And so next Sunday, I'll be preaching on that topic, and I just wanted to give you the heads up. Jesus wants to see us. And there's nothing more he wants than for us to see him. And for Bartimaeus, he could hear him, and he called for him, and, and Jesus responded to his cry, and he came, and what do you want? I want to see. He gave him his sight, and he followed. This is Bartimaeus' story. But we're in John 9, and you're asking, are we going to get to John 9? I didn't read Mark 10, Pastor. I read John 9. Well, here we go, John 9, the story you've been waiting to hear. It's a very similar story, blind man and Jesus. This was a little bit different, though, because uh, there's mud involved. If you're listening to uh, Reverend Chris pray, uh, this is what he was talking about um, in his prayer. But let me start here with just the first few verses to kind of get us into the story. So John chapter nine begins this way. As he went along, Jesus, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Is this his sin or his parents' sin? Because they understood that sin is what caused ailments such as these. And Jesus responds, he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened, this, this blindness, is so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. From the get-go, we have this very interesting, troubling question. The disciples asked Jesus, why is this man blind? Is it something he did or something his parents did? Now, that question catches me right from, from the beginning because I don't know about you, but there have been times when I've driven by homeless people and I've thought, is this their fault or their parents' fault? They do this to get themselves into this trouble or they just grow up in a rough home where they had no other options but to end up on the street. We go right into critical mode, critique mode. What's wrong with them and their problems? But it seems like Jesus is saying there's a better question that we could be asking. Not why are they this way? Whose fault is it that this has come upon them? But a question that has a little more hope ringing in it. I wonder what Jesus could do here. I wonder what Jesus could do with this. I wonder what Jesus could do for him, for her, for them, for me. I wonder what Jesus might do to make the works of God, the power of God visible in this moment, right here, right now. Maybe we've been asking the wrong questions 
about the problems we see in the world. From the very beginning, we get that. The other thing we get is that last week, we were told that, that we are the light of the world. Jesus said he was the light of the world, and then uh, we had Drew hearken back to the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus said to us, not I want you to be the light of the world, but you are the light of the world. But here in this verse, he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world, and now that Jesus is not physically in the world, we know as believers that he is now in us. It's an echo from last week that we are the light of the world. If light is gonna shine in dark places, quit asking for it from someone up there, out there. Ask inside, Jesus, are you in me? And can I bring light into this dark place? If you find somebody walking in darkness, you don't say, hey, I know where the light is and walk away. You say, light is in me, Jesus is in me, and I'd like to stand with you right now so that a little bit of the light in me can lighten up the dark that's in you. And you do it right then and right there. You don't say, I'll do it later. You do it right then, and you do it right there, because you are the light of the world. The scripture continues in verse six. After saying this, Jesus, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with the saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes, and he, he told him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. The word Siloam means scent. So the man went, and he washed, and when he came home, he was seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging, they asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. And others said, no, he just looks like that guy. But he himself insisted, no, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked him. He said, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, and so I did. I went and I washed, and when the mud was gone, I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. I got a couple questions about this. First off, it's kind of a silly question. Did he have any idea how that mud had been made? <laughs> you know, I, I hate to admit that I, I've heard a few Hank Williams songs. I, how about that line, I'd love to spit some beech nut in that dude's eye? <laughs> Sorry, this is what comes to this weird guy's head when he's reading scripture. I thought, Jesus just spit in this dude's eye. <laughs> but he didn't know it, or did he? Did he know that, that God put his DNA into the dirt that the guy had been made from, humus? Unlike creation where God took dirt and blew breath into it to make humans in this moment, to make this human more alive. He took spit, the DNA of God, into the dirt of man, mixed it all up, and then wiped it on his eyes. Did he know all that was happening in that moment? I don't know. Here's another question that came to me. This blind beggar, he'd been doing it for a while. We'll find out a little bit later in the story. He was a little bit older, you mean these people didn't recognize him? You mean these people he'd been begging blind for all these years and they didn't identify him on the spot? It just made me wonder how many times they turned to look away as they walked by him. It made me wonder how many times they walked on the other side of the road so that he wouldn't hear their footsteps passing him by. How do you not know that that's the guy? And at the end, when they say to him, where is this man? I thought, is that a blind joke? Like, what do you mean? Where did he go? I was blind. <laughs> he left me with mud on my eyes, and I'm blind. With mud on my eyes. I'm doubly blind. <laughs> what do you mean, where did he go? I don't know. We pick up in the next verse. I hope I don't go too long here, but this is the word of God, and you're gonna meet with Jesus. And we're gonna sit here until you do. <laughs> Verse 13 goes this way. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Oh, boy, he's gonna get in trouble. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. The guy says, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. 
Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. You know, there's some things like spirit of the law and letter of the law. And maybe they were trying to refer to the spirit of the law in this moment when it was convenient for them and expand what Jesus had done into, well, it doesn't check this box or this box or this box. Oh, wait, he did a healing. Healing on the Sabbath, illegal. And Jesus talks about that in other places. The thing that I found myself, in this one moment, I wanted to go to the letter of the law. I'm usually a spirit of the law kind of a guy. But in this moment, I wanted to defend him and say, what was the letter of the law? Was it really against the Sabbath to spit on the ground? Was it against the law to make mud with your own spit? Like, what did all the little kids do on their Sabbath? I mean, that's what we do. We spit in the mud, and we make mud, and we put little army guys in it. Was that really against the law to spit in the dirt? It was against the law to put mud on somebody's eyes. Was it against the law for a blind man to walk to a, a pool of water and to wash his face? What part of that's against the law? Like these stinking Pharisees, they always want to get in the way of God doing good stuff. Hope is a good churchman. I never become a Pharisee. Who cares more about the rules and the laws and the, that ain't how we do it here. That I condemn a man for healing another man. So they asked this man what he thinks about the guy who healed him. He said, I think he's a prophet. I still don't believe. Because in that moment, he's basically saying, yeah, I think he's got the same power that Isaiah had or Jeremiah had or any of the other prophets that we read from their scrolls. They weren't hearing it. The Pharisees didn't like that. They still don't believe that he could be the guy. And so they call for his parents. And this is where it gets pretty interesting. So they call for his parents and they say, hey, hey, mom and dad, you know this guy? Well, yeah, he's our son. Do you know how he got healed? Mm -mm. All we know is he's our son. And we can confirm he was blind when he was born. But what's happened to him, we don't know. And the Bible says that, that they say they don't want to admit that they, that they know anything about this because it might get them thrown out of the synagogue. They say, ask him what happened. Let him tell you. He's old enough. Verses 24 to 34, it's a lot to read, but I'm gonna try to read it because it's important. The second time they summoned the man who had been blind, give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man's a sinner. And he says, the man who is, was blind and now sees, says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, though, I was blind and now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He said, I've told you already, and you didn't listen. You want to hear it again? Why? So you can become his disciples too? <laughs> I love that dude. That's the guy I want to meet when I get to heaven. Just look at the church and mouth off. <laughs> then they hurled insults, these Pharisees. They hurled insults at him, and they said, you are this fellow's disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but this fella, we don't even know where he comes from. The man said, now that's remarkable, stunning. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing, this man says. To this, the guys, the Pharisees, they were all men replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. And I think, you never let him in in the first place. Blind beggars, not invited to the synagogue in those days. Something's wrong with you. You're wrapped in sin. We don't want that stuff in here. The ancient church kept all the ones who were in the most need out on the outskirts, away, out of the synagogue and out of town. So they didn't have to deal with them. I wonder what dirty person on the margins of the Wood Forest community is out there because they don't think they're invited in here. I wonder how many people out there, your next door neighbors, think that, man, if I could just get it all together, they'd let me in their church. How many of them are waiting to, to be good enough in your eyes when they go out to get their trash can, they show you their best, hoping that one day you'll invite them to the place where you go, where apparently good people go. 
wonder how many people you know who have just been waiting to encounter somebody who would look at them and say, you are good, not because of who you are and what you've done, but because I made you and I called you good. And there's nothing you've ever done that'll get in the way of the goodness that I see in you. I wonder how many blind beggars are sitting on the outskirts of this church. I know of one, he's an atheist, he'll be spinning a sign just south of here today at the art gallery. He invited me to invite you to come to the art gallery to see art, it's free, it's a family thing. And if you love art or you love atheist people, I pray you'd go south on this road out of our community. You'd go and give a high five or a hug to Joe. And then you go look at some art. This guy, all he had was a testimony. That's all he had. They kept trying to ask him, how did this happen? What did he do? I don't know. I had mud on my eyes. I went to that pool. I washed my eyes. I could see. I didn't even know where he went. I was blind. But now I see. He really had nothing to lose. He'd never been accepted by the church before and, or valued by the church before and he doesn't need the church. He had Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, when the church is gone, we'll still have Jesus. If this church were to close its doors today, tomorrow, there'd still be Jesus. He'd still be there, still available. In the meantime, though, we create space where you can come and you can meet with him. We open doors, we put heat on when it's cold outside and air conditioning when it's hot outside. We even this week added window tint a little darker so that the glare wouldn't hurt your eyes anymore. For those who are watching from home would have a better experience. That's truth. Put a big W on the outside of the gym wall so the people driving by would be able to see it. It's not a warehouse, but a church. Trying to create spaces where people can encounter Jesus, we've made it about as easy as we possibly can. We sing songs to lure your heart that direction. We speak words to convict you and to console you. And we give you one another all so that you can meet Jesus. But I'm gonna tell you, there's so much more I wanna tell you. I'm just gonna end here. Uh, this past week at staff meeting, um, we were sitting, we were, it was a beautiful day, we were sitting out uh, on the porch, and uh, last weekend, some of you know this because you have middle school kids who were at this event, maybe, but we were, we were sitting outside, and we kind of go around, our staff meetings are not very productive at all. <laughs> They're really not. I mean, every now and then, Pam gets us on task, and we handle business, but most of the time, it's just relationships, it's just listening to each other, loving each other. This past week, Doc and I were, were offered some chocolate cake with Snickers stuff all over. And Ann, if you're watching from home, he ate more than everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Get you in trouble, Doc. We eat cake together. But we were, we were there, and while we were together, you know, it was worth it. Hey, tell me what's going on in your ministry, what you've done lately, and this and that, this and that. And Thomas speaks up. He said, I got a story to tell. And uh, he says, we were just a wild weekend. And boy, was it wild. And he had told me a little bit of this, and so I was curious to hear the rest of the story. Uh, in that circle, one of our other staff members had a kid that went there and has not been having a great time with life these days, but he went to that retreat. So first, before Thomas spoke, we asked her, hey, hey, how'd your son describe the weekend? Was it wild? He goes, she says, I heard it was fun, had a good time. That's it. I said, well, I think that more happened than that. I said, Thomas, what else happened? And he tells this story. Thomas says, we were in this time of worship in the evening, 70 or 80 junior high kids from our campus and the other one, in a retreat, we had the musicians, they were singing songs, leading the kids in worship, and there was high energy, fun songs, and there was meaningful, more reflective songs, and we were in that more meaningful, reflective time, and he said, I was supposed to give the talk. I'd been preparing. I know we had four talks to give over the course of that last week, and this was the last one. I'm sure he poured all, everything he had left in him into this talk, and he he says, I was sitting there waiting for that song to end so I could go up and give my talk, and then the worship leader went into a new song. It wasn't on the list, but the chorus of that song is, oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. He said, so I closed my eyes, and I, I just went into a time of prayer, and when I opened my eyes to walk up to the stage, every kid in that room was on their knees weeping. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a junior hire in your home. You ever watched junior hires? Ever been to a junior high school? 
But the very last thing you'd expect from junior high kids to be on their knees weeping. He said, I lifted my eyes. I saw that. I went up to the stage, and Jesus tells me, don't you preach. I've already given my word to these kids, and they're responding to me even now. So he's sensitive to the spirit. That's one of the things we love about Thomas. He's sensitive to the spirit, and he threw out his talk that he had spent a lot of time preparing, where he could have oohed and awed them with his speaking ability that many of you have experienced. He just began to pray over these kids for release, for if there was something causing depression, then that it would be broken loose. If there was some sense of forgiveness a kid needed, that they would feel forgiven. If there was some sort of struggle a kid was experiencing, that they would feel set free, that Jesus would meet with them, would, the Holy Spirit would fall on them and heal them. That's all that happened for the rest of the night. It was prayer over these kids as they were being healed. On Wednesday night, I was on my way home from the FCA gala. I got to go hear a Tim Tebow, woohoo! Uh, great guy. Sorry, Tim, if you're watching, you were really great. Um, he's not watching. But on my drive home with my dad, Thomas calls me and says, hey, we had our NEON meeting tonight. Middle schoolers all meet here on Wednesday night. Some high schoolers help support them and encourage them. I said, how'd it go? He said, well, man, I thought what we experienced back at the Wild Weekend was something. He said, it, it showed up again on Wednesday night here. I said, I, I'm thinking to myself, I don't even know if I said it out loud, but I was thinking to myself, I can't remember the last time I saw a grown person on their knees weeping in the presence of the Lord. I can't remember the last time Jesus encountered an adult in our church so powerfully that they couldn't help but have tears escape their eyes. He told me that a young lady that was there in a conversation with, with one of her leaders expressed the loneliness and the brokenness she'd been feeling and that self-harm had been a part of her thoughts. So my prayer is this that the residue of what middle schoolers are doing in this space will become the thing that we experience in this place. That teenagers who are showing up hungry to see Jesus, to have their blindness turned into sight would be the same attitude of the heart that you bring with you each week. That on a Sunday morning, it wouldn't be just a Sunday morning. It'd be, this is the day we go to see Jesus. And we show up screaming like blind Bartimaeus, Jesus over here, I need you. Or we come with a posture of the blind man in John 9, who when Jesus showed up, we willingly let him put spit and mud in our eyes that we might see. I ran out of time a long time ago, so I should just pray. God, we're about to sing a song called Open the Eyes of My Heart. The chorus, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. God, right now, would you uh, grow in us a desire to see you? Would you point out the places in our lives where we have come to expect and even allow blindness to guide us? Would you wake us up from this slumber that we have fallen into where we sleepwalk through a life of comfort and ease, a life that we believe we created that would you open our eyes to the life that you have for us? Would you allow us to wipe the sleepy out of our eyes and to become more and more aware of what you're calling us to, where you're leading us? God, I imagine if I had been a man born blind, that after all those years of blindness, never having any light touch my eyes, that when I came away from that pool with water dripping from my cheeks and I began to open my eyes, that it would be bold, <laughs> blinding light entering my eyes for the first time. And so I pray, God, if there's anyone in this space who has never had their eyes open to the light of Jesus, that it would come like a bright, light, come like a bright light, 
And that all the things they thought life was about, all the things they imagined life was about as they were blind, would come into really clear view for them. They'd see themselves anew. They'd see this world in new ways. You have opened up the eyes of the blind. You've done it before. Will you do it again now? Even now, as we open our eyes from this prayer, open the eyes of our heart, Lord. We want, we want to see you.